For most young people, an Operation Rally expedition is a chance to live and work with remote communities all over the world. An adventure to develop individual potential and learn to overcome the impossible. For a few, it provides an opportunity to make a film. This week's film, shot by students at the Royal College of Art, is set in the Indonesian jungle. The Java Sea, a thousand miles east of Borneo. These young men and women have survived a grueling selection process to become venturers on one of Operation Rally's most challenging expeditions. It's an important part of a worldwide scientific study of tropical rainforests. Their destination, the Indonesian island of Saran. Even for Rally, this is a very ambitious operation. 200 people will live and work for three months on this remote and largely unexplored island. A dense jungle soaring from sea level to 9,000 feet. A unique region known as Wallachia, where the flora and fauna of Asia and Australasia meet. The reason why scientists and venturers have come here. Manusela National Park is 700 square miles of tropical rainforest and it's carefully guarded, at least around the perimeter, by forest rangers. It's a rare opportunity for them to exercise their authority. An easy walk to base camp is the venturer's first taste of jungle conditions, and some of them are finding it tough. They're carrying too much. The scientists are old hands. They set their own pace and travel light. Supplies for three months have to be shifted, and for £2.50 a day, local farmers are willing to do it. The going is just as tough for them. On this march, one of them suffered a fatal heart attack. In a blistering 90 degrees and saturation humidity, 10 miles has taken four hours. It's been a rough and sobering introduction for the venturers. Soon, they'll look back on it as a gentle country stroll. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly a step into the unknown. An advanced party of venturers and army trained staff has been here for six weeks, building three base camps and cutting the trails that link them. Major Wandi Swales is in charge of the expedition. He's just arrived, like everyone else, the hard way. I was very stupid. I wore just very thin nylon socks and didn't appreciate and totally forgot the problems of sweating a lot and having your feet wet all the time. After all, you told the ventures. <laughs> After all, I told the ventures. Very stupid. Um, we knew that the distances were tremendous, and but people on recce's tend to be some of the fitter people and laugh off the distance and the timing. But for Mr. or Miss Average, this is quite a quite a place to get to, and I don't think it should be undertaken lightly. And it's a lesson to us on phase two of the expedition, or all the next phases and the next expedition indeed, um, to calculate much more sensibly on movement, and particularly because. We're now having to carry extra weights, extra food and weights into the other expedition areas. 
We had to carry the poor old porter who died. And he wasn't a large man, and I, I found it. And so did Mick Day, very heavy going when we did our spells on the stretcher. Four of us, one on each corner. You can imagine a small group of four people with an injured person trying to carry them out and injured and alive and being hurt when they're being joggled. It's a very tough, very tough problem. And the other, as with all jungle terrain, is the problem of getting the message out. We just haven't enough radios. But what we've got are sensibly deployed. We record in a book each day where people are going, as with normal patrols, say, in the army. You do know where they're going, you know the route, you know what they're going to do, and you know how they're coming back. So if you lose them, we can maybe get a party out to help. Um, we have to watch that one very carefully. We couldn't cover a place as big as this safely. The expedition will work all over Suram, but in fact you don't have to go far to find its rich wildlife. Near the Camp Latrines, the reptile group has already discovered the island's most dangerous inhabitant, the death adder. One bite can kill in less than four hours, and there's no serum here. It's still in a fridge back in London. He's holding death in his hands there. Stick it in the camera. Despite the dangers of the island, in these early days, it seemed like paradise. These are lovely camps. They're in beautiful settings. The scientists have got into jungle that is really of use to them and of interest to them. Some of our finds and catches already are exciting. One or two, the first ever recorded on Saram that we know of, or this individual scientist knows of. The venturers seem to be in very great heart. I think the staff is working splendidly together. And so far, I can't say that uh, there's anything wrong. No, I think uh, overall, I'm very pleased. And people are fabulous, staff are excellent and fabulous, and uh, scientists happy. Lovely place to be, if only we didn't have to walk. On any day, there are groups coming and going between the base camps. 21 separate research projects are underway. They're studying everything from soil, trees and birds to orchids and bats. Eventually, it will add up to a detailed scientific profile of Saram's rainforest. On every march, the scientists, with venturers assisting, collect specimens and valuable research data. Bob Payton is leading a group of geologists and botanists. Their foraging trips have been very successful, but success means more to carry. If you add a roll of orchids to a bag of wet soil samples loaded on top of necessary supplies, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. After five grueling days in the jungle, working soaked to the skin and sleeping rough, there's a break for rest and recreation at Kaniki Base Camp. The scientists freely admit that their achievements depend entirely on the enthusiasm and energy of the venturers, but there's a limit to the stamina of youth. It was very hard work. It was, was really not holiday. It was, uh, I think, a bit too hard because I thought that this is a, a bit uh, a tropic paradise. But in fact, uh, the Swiss arm is not this hard. Is it too cold, boy? Uh, is that very painful? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Okay, are you in pain? Yeah, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Stephen Hill, one of the two doctors with the expedition, thinks that Ian has trodden on a scorpion. Only on his return to England will Ian learn that, in fact, a hookworm has burrowed into his foot and laid its eggs. Can you put up with that? Okay. The jungle's carpet of soggy leaf litter brings other problems too. Even specially designed army boots are no match for it. I've had the boots now for about two weeks. The first out to go when I was walking along a stony riverbed and then the heels just dropped off. This is my own right boot, but um, when this one went, I borrowed a right boot off a lad whose left boot had already gone. So I managed to make a pair of that, then his right boot went as well. Then my left boot went. So now I've got three boots and all of them are gone. This is the first one I tried to stitch and it seems to be working okay. I've super glued it, stitched it. Now I'm going to tape it. So then it'll be stronger than before. It'll have to be like, because I'm going to deny it again. <laughs> It'll be about six years March. It's very wrinkled, isn't it? Smile, oh, I feel sorry for it. Do they bite? So I've been told. Come back, smile. Come on. It's your last chance to be still before you dump. Oh, that's, that's wicked. Put your pin down board. It's the first time I've held a bat and it could be the last. <laughs> it bites. Oh, they bite and they don't let go. Look up. Oh, let go. Caught it down in the river. It it's hungry good? again now. Mm -hmm. And how big would it get? I don't know how big these get. I mean, the English medicinal leeches, I've seen them up to a foot long and they're fully extended. The horse leech and so the medicinal leeches get pretty big. So how much blood would they take me to get 18 inches long? They must drain quite a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. They get very flat. It's often impossible to make accurate scientific classifications in the field. Inevitably, some specimens will have to be taken back to Britain. The expedition has got permission from the government in Jakarta to do this, but no one has told the Manusela Park Rangers. <laughs> Negotiating with the men from the ministry is a diplomatic problem for rally staff. For the scientists, the work in hand always comes first and they have enough to cope with as it is. The logistics were pretty hairy to get stuff here, but also I think that we pushed it rather too hard to get over Kobe Proto. We made it and people were nearly at the end of their tether, but um, I think we were within safety margins when we did it. But it was a very hard march. The conditions were very difficult, very steep slopes, getting quite cold at night at the top, very wet, people with wet boots, starting to get fungal troubles with their feet, and a lack of water on the, uh, on the north side of Kobe Poto when we were coming up. That was the main problem. So we didn't have enough quarters. This meant that we didn't have food to last us the time, and we had to work on half rations. I have not been on an expedition where the porters have quite been treated in the way they have here. They've been treated very separately, and I feel to some extent perhaps not provided for uh, as well as they could have been. And that may be part of the trouble, but also you've got to remember on Suram that uh, people don't like portering. Here the loads they will take are very light, 15 kilos is about the limit. Um, now we're carrying packs sometimes 20, 25 kilos ourselves. So <laughs> they've also got to carry their own food, which often amounts to a porter carrying the porter's food and we've now got problems going up at Gunang Banaya. We've decided, the scientists have decided, to take tents to protect the porters, which again means another porter or two porters to carry the tents. So you end up having three porters carrying the porter's gear. Some of the venturers have reservations of their own. Ashley Hyatt. Um, 
I don't know, we're continually told that it's a logistical uh, problem of moving things around and getting uh, supplies to be where they want people to be. But at the same time, there doesn't seem to be that much communication on a sort of like verbal level as between staff and scientists, and staff and venturers, and just generally between all the groups involved. So that nothing can be really sort of thrashed out to actually come upon a sort of like a new program which can then be worked out and the supplies worked around that. Probably a good walker. Robert Cole. He now he's over. Um, Does he want to go to the shop? He's done. What it. Ashley doesn't know is that second in charge, Captain Chris Kendall, appointed only on the day that the venturers arrived, really is trying his best to put together a plan of operations that will keep everyone happy and safe. We're getting there. We're very nearly there now. Um, there are many different routes which people have got to go on. Is there enough It's a question of making sure that there are enough people to go on those routes. Will there be enough radios to keep everyone in contact and stuff while they're Not on the routes, no. Haven't got enough. Do you anticipate problems? Um, not if there are people on the routes who've already been those routes. So far we've been OK, but if we hit any major difficulties, then it could be rather nasty. Um, with the moth group coming over copy photo, for instance, they've been out of radio contact now for what, a week, week and a half? Um, and you've got to trust that they can get a runner down if something goes wrong. It, it might have been OK had all the radios we've got worked, but when we get six radios and two of them are not functional, plus a third one's acting up, then it makes life extremely difficult. <clears throat> In spite of the difficulties of communications, work goes on. There are now groups travelling on routes all over the island, most without radio contact. Oh, and you can see Kaneke village from up there. Like a tiny little speck. It was great. Yeah. There are still some people up there working on the plots. Um, but we got most of them done, which is really good. Uh, it looks like an advert for Elastoplast. Fell <laughs> apart. <laughs> but he's still up there. Yeah, Gene and Ian. Every expedition depends on mental discipline, physical effort, and a degree of luck. Despite early problems, after four weeks, Operation Rally Indonesia is in good shape and in good heart. But luck is about to run out on them. Paul Claxton was the expedition's official photographer. Do you want to put it on your rucksack strap like this? Because when you hike, you tend to walk along like that. OK, this is good. Can you look at me? I want to see the logo. Publicity pictures are important when an organisation relies on sponsorship. Paul's portfolio of photographs of Saram would be complete with shots from 9,000 feet up at the top of Mount Benaya, the island's highest peak. He travelled halfway up Benaya with a party on a routine climb, then left them and continued to the summit. As a food supply would be needed there later, Ashley Hyatt volunteered to accompany Paul and take rations up at the same time. The following day, Paul and Ashley were reported missing. At first, the venturers were more concerned with the weather. People had been out of contact for more than a day before. There was no need for alarm. After 48 hours, however, a full search began. A helicopter lent by the Indonesian army joined in, but without instruments, it couldn't penetrate the dense cloud that now shrouded the island. They tried every day, and every day they were forced to return to base. It's been five days now since uh, Paul and Ashley have been missing. The search in the field still continues. Um, 
a bit of news that came through last night. At 8 o'clock, um, torchlights were seen uh, further down the mountain. Um, we're not too sure whether this is Paul and Ashley or whether or not it's uh, a scientific project group working on one of their projects uh, in the night. Um, at the minute, we're just waiting to hear more news about that. Um, we've sent somebody down the mountain to try and find out some more information. Um, we were hoping to get a helicopter to try again to come to the island to Benaya this afternoon, um, but unfortunately that one's just been cancelled too due to the bad weather. Too far from the mountain to help the search parties, the venturers could only try to make sense of what little information they could glean from the radio. How would families back home react to the news that two people were missing? It will be on the news. Yeah. And it will be in all the newspapers, both local and national. No, it can happen in Snowdonia. Or I know it can happen anywhere, but the it fact wouldn't happen, is put it that, way, I'm you that, that for most people home. at home, it's not good enough to say that someone just disobeyed instructions. People might be able to question why but one venturer was walking like up to base camp to a camp by himself anyway. No, Paul Claxton was with Ashley himself. No, but ha did Paul Claxton arrive by Paul himself Claxton with given the food? Orders. No, they all went with not Jeremy, to go. and he was told not to go with out Did Paul kids. Claxton right travel up with Paul Jeremy? Paul Claxton was not told no, not to go no. beyond Camp 2. But where would like they take him for ages in general? I mean, David was... Did they find many people out there searching water. for the thing now, I mean, but they're going to have the search and rescue coming in as well, so there's some, what do they say, there's 16 men out in one search today. There's a limit to what you could do. After six days of mounting concern, news finally came. Ashley had got to the peak. Paul had taken his photographs and Ashley had set up the food dump. After a night's sleep, they made their way back down, but soon lost the path. On an exceptionally treacherous mountainside, Paul slipped and fell 200 feet. Ashley called out to him, but there was no reply. Since he couldn't climb down to Paul, Ashley tried to retrace his steps back up the mountain to get help, but then he also fell. I fell to a point where I was below Paul, and he was inaccessible to me. I, I knew I'd injured myself. I sort of like came round after having been unconscious for a while, and I was just wet with both rain and blood. And uh, there was no way I could, could get up to assess Paul's situation. So I decided after a night's sleep to try and gain some height. It took me about two days to climb 500 meters because all the time my, I knew my ankles were very badly sort of bruised. I did, wasn't sure if they were broken, but every sort of like 10 or 15 steps they would just fold over under me and I'd fall over. In fact, Ashley made that climb with both ankles broken, several smashed ribs, and a collapsed lung. But as soon as I got up a bit higher, although I'd set up a rain trap and sort of made myself some sort of comfortable bed, there was just no rain for the next four days. The only, the only water I was able to get was where the cloud had sort of condensed on the bivy bay, which I lit daily. And that was, that was the only sort of like sustenance that I had. And then I just, I just sort of kind of sat it out there for a while. It was, being sat up there was quite unusual because it didn't feel like I was alone. It seemed like there was about other, another five people there who were these sort of like amalgamated personalities all of whom had sort of characteristic traits of individuals. It was al almost like myself, I wasn't injured or anything like that. 
each one of them seemed to have one of my entries. And I was sort of like in charge of the situation and actually well myself. But it was sort of like in my head, they kept sort of like moaning to me about either sort of like their feet hurt or their ribs hurt or the bed that I'd made wasn't very comfortable. And that seemed to, that seemed to help sort of like me get through in a calm kind of way. And one of them kept suggesting that a helicopter was going to arrive the next day. Although I knew that the possibility of a helicopter wasn't that likely because there'd always been a helicopter problem before. And then on about, I think it was the fifth day when I woke up, there was, well, the night before, there had been the most amazing sunset. And the next morning when I woke up, there was an incredible sunrise. And I seemed quite content then. It seemed like all the, all the sort of like worry and everything else of like the possibility of not being saved or being saved completely gone. And this, I, f I felt sort of a feeling of calmness and contentment, almost as if it didn't matter anymore, that I, I wasn't going to be found. And that, that at least here was better than say being um, knocked over by a London bus where you know you didn't really know anything about it it's almost like I'd accepted the fact that I might not be found and within a couple of hours all of a sudden these two local villagers from Saran from Kanike turned up and I, I really didn't know how to deal with this situation sort of gave a sort of like a benign wave and said hello this is a, a kind of um, s sounds almost as stupid as sort of like dr livingstone i presume and uh passed me passed me a half a liter of water and I, I sort of asked after having four days with that having a cigarette or anything like that do you have a spare cigarette and the guy gave me gave me three cigarettes and said, you relax, take it easy, I've had a hard time. I'm gonna go and build a camp, we'll come and collect you in a minute. Just take in the scenery and be calm and we'll see you all right. Ashley felt certain that Paul's fall had been fatal, but back at camp, everyone was hoping otherwise. was buried in England. The staff of Operation Raleigh, the scientists and the venturers all decided that the expedition should go on. Research continued successfully for another six weeks. New venturers arrived for the second phase and new projects were started. When Ashley Hyatt recovered, he volunteered to go back to the jungle, this time to Cameroon in West Africa, on another Operation Rally expedition. Mm -hmm. 